He was Joe Namath off Broadway. This is a big game, girls. We gotta, we gotta score a touchdown. Now let's go. If reality television was around, he would have been the biggest reality star of all. He really was a serious football player. He is the single most vain human being I've ever met. The King, today on NFL Films Presents. I've been making football movies for more than 40 years. And in that time, I've met my share of larger-than-life characters, and I've listened to plenty of outrageous stories. But amazingly, the most flamboyant player I ever met was a quarterback who never threw a touchdown pass in the NFL. He was a minor league superstar with a major league personality. His name was Jim Corcoran, but everybody knew him as the king. Seven years before Saturday Night Fever, Jim Corcoran strutted the streets of Pottstown, Pennsylvania for NFL films. First of all, I dig living right. I dig going first class. And I like making money and I like playing football. Yeah, that's part of being a king. We were filming a documentary about a minor league football team called the Firebirds. I'm gonna make it someday. The Firebird quarterback drives to Pottstown in a style befitting the title he's held through four NFL tryouts. He's James P. Corcoran, the king. This is King Corcoran calling. I'm in my car. In those days, the only person I'd ever seen with a telephone in his car was President Nixon. And even he probably didn't have a full bar and a Coke machine in his trunk. I was driving down here and I picked up some uh, hippie cats. You know, they were just coming back from that demonstration in Washington, you know? One kid hasn't eaten in two days, man. The other, they have 25 cents between them. And they're telling me all the things that are wrong with this country. This country's this, we ought to do this, we ought to do that. And, and the king's driving down, you know, first class, right? My Lincoln, my telephone, my stereo. I said, hey, you guys, take a look at yourselves and take a look at me. I says, who's right and who's wrong? The show aired on national television just before Super Bowl VI it, camouflage it. Camouflage and introduced America to the hard-knock world of minor league football. People call it minor league, sandlot, all that stuff. It was, it was much better than that. At that time, the Pottstown Firebirds were functioning as the farm team of the Philadelphia Eagles. Come on, guys, that's it now. We got them on a run. Let's get it quick one now. The Firebirds were the best team in that league, and King Corcoran was the best quarterback. That's it, huh? All right, King, all right, way to throw that ball, King. Feeling it tonight, feeling it tonight. The best way to describe the King was he was Joe Namath off Broadway. The same kind of swagger, the same kind of lifestyle. Perfect throw, perfect, right there, where'd he go? That documentary was a perfect vehicle to put out all the aspects of the King and all of his glory. It also captured the king at his worst. I just stick to the game plan or I have no problem. All right, I just don't, don't get me thinking conservative. Keep the ball on the ground, keep the ball on the ground. I, I can't think like that. I like to have, you know, my, my free hand in there, you know what I mean? Now keep the ball on the ground. Remember. <laughs> I'm not going to take this stuff from anyone, including Cochran. I'm not sore. I'm damn sore. King Cochran is lead the league, but at this point, I cannot in any possibly way stay with him. All these hot, touchdown, touchdown. The film ends with King watching from the sidelines as his teammates win the championship of their league. I'm trying to prove to people that I should be playing NFL football. That's my goal in life right now. It can be done. And if anybody can do it, the King can do it. Actually, the King had already had his shot at big time pro football. Late in the 1968 season, he played in two games for the Boston Patriots. These three passes were his only completions in the AFL. In the final game of the season, King's time in the big time came to an all too familiar end. The coach sent in a play and Jimmy says, that play's not gonna work. And he calls his own play and he goes back and throws an interception. Boston's passing game was a study of ineptitude. And that was the end of him on the Boston Patriots. He really was a serious football player. It's a shame he couldn't take coaching. 
couldn't, he was uncoachable, really. King solved that problem by becoming a player coach on the World Football League's Philadelphia Bell in 1974, where he befriended a young receiver destined to become invincible. King and I, we always ran together. You know, we, we partied pretty hard and, and had a good time together, and, uh, and I was his guy. The King that year in 74, when I came in as a rookie, had 34 touchdowns. And he was just zinging it all over the place. He just it was all accuracy, all timing, all speed. Nobody knew the offense better than he did. He was a tremendous leader. Everybody wanted to follow him. But when the World League folded in 1975, so did King's career. This is a big game, girls. We gotta, we gotta score a touchdown. Now let's go. We gotta beat these kids. In the original Pottstown Firebirds documentary, we were introduced to King's family during a game of touch football. And I get that dog. Hey, dog, leave that ball alone. I was three when they did the Pottstown Firebirds. I remember I was crying because I really wanted to be on the show. There's this little snippet of me on that movie, and I am crying. Go in and get the guy with the ball. That was such a big deal to my dad to be on camera. Oh, I didn't catch the ball. If reality television was around, he would have been the biggest reality star of all. He would have taken the Kardashians and blown them off the map. If you think growing up Gotti was an odd experience, try growing up Corcoran. We're at having a barbecue. He's late in the charcoals. It takes 25 minutes for the briquettes to get hot. My mother says, hey, we need some hot dog rolls. Will you go get some rolls? He said, sure. He goes to get the rolls and comes home three days later. He comes home three days later with a really dark tan. I mean, he looked great. My mother said, what happened? The sun was shining. And he had the rolls with him. The receipt was three days later. So he was coming home, but he heard on the radio that the weather was going to be great in Ocean City. My radio's blasting. So we went to our beach house, and there was no phone hooked up. So I laid down on my blanket, honey. So he just laid out in the sun for three days by himself. He has a thing about being tan. King is losing his tan. When the time's here. He didn't like a tan line, so he used to lay out totally naked with nothing but a tube sock for a bathing suit. When the sun don't shine, your love don't give me no tan. And my mother was like, the neighbors are going to call, you're going to get an indecent exposure thing. And he didn't care. It was un just unbelievable narcissism. I think he was probably the first one to ever use teeth whitener. <laughs> I mean, he really had the whitest teeth I've ever seen in anybody in my life back in those days. When he was at Maryland, he used to trim my diapers and put them in the heel to make himself six foot one. Remember, he had so many lifts in his shoes, he could never yeah, see, tie his see shoes. See, his ankles are coming out of his shoes. He has four lifts in his shoes to make himself six foot two, even though he's about barely six feet even. He was an interesting bird. And he didn't drink. That was the amazing thing. The guy did not drink. Never drank alcohol, never smoked cigarettes, never did drugs. It was actually done out of vanity. He was the single most vain human being I've ever met. He was so into being King Corcoran, he felt if he got drunk, if he did drugs, he might not be King Corcoran. I really respect him for it in a weird, perverse sort of way. He definitely had an addictive personality, but his addiction was, you know, the adulation of other people. He needed attention like a drug addict needs drugs. He had to be the center of attention all the time, and if he wasn't, he was very unhappy and miserable. That's when we went to Disney World, and he was upset because nobody recognized him in Orlando. We were walking around Disney World, he was upset because nobody knew him, and we're not from Florida, we're from Maryland. My mother's like, why would they know you? Well, I was out here, we played the Orlando Panthers in 72. Oof, <laughs> the, the, the crowd isn't gonna be at Disney World. We don't ever think my dad could recover from the fact that he was no longer in the limelight. This is in the middle of winter. This is another outfit that he would wear at the grocery store. He'd start putting that tanning stuff on QT. it. QT. Yeah, QT. He'd rub it all over his legs so he could wear shorts. Those are Philadelphia Bell socks. You see the colors? And he would wear, that's what he would wear at the grocery store. He couldn't go and get a regular job. He couldn't do it. He retired in 1975. 1977, he had a nervous breakdown. We didn't know what it was at the time. He walked around the house in a black robe for an entire year. Didn't shave, didn't go to work. He just was in like, just a depression he couldn't get out of. Typically people bounce out of depression in, you know, six months. Most people do without treatment. And he kind of did once he found another avenue for people to pay attention to him. I walk in and Jimmy Corcoran is dressed up in a polo outfit, the riding pants and the whole bed. The pants were skin tight. The boots were so polished I could see my face in them. I said, riding, he said, Polo. I said, why? He said, appearance is everything, Tone. It's fun and it's where the money is. He could barely swing the mallet and make contact with the ball, but he's such a good promoter with the swagger. He had people thinking he was a five-goal player. He used to say, Polo's the sport of kings and I'm a king. 
so it's something I have to play. But the King's polo costume often masked his tremendous insecurity. One time we were in the grocery store. He's wearing his polo uniform, and usually people give him adulation. Hey, it's the King, whatever. And Yvonne Lendl's in the deli, the tennis player. And everybody's fawning all over Yvonne Lendl. He goes, Jimbo, come here. Who is this guy? And I says, his name's Yvonne Lendl. He said, what does he do? I said, he's a tennis player. Is he any good? I said, he's like ranked number one in the world. He played at Wimbledon. He's won the US Open. So what's everybody making such a big deal about him for? <laughs> and I, you know, he, I just gave him the reason why he's so good. And he was so mad. He goes, I don't know why they're, 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 they're kissing his He goes, did you hear him talk? He can't even order ham. <laughs> it's just because he had a Czechoslovakian accent. And that's the king. He couldn't stand to be around other athletes. If someone has a bigger name than him, it makes him feel uncomfortable. He has to be the main guy in the room. The same applied to family gatherings. He ruined every Christmas. Every Christmas, he would go into like a catatonic state, couldn't stand watching us open up our toys. We'd open our presents up, and then he'd be like, his eyes would be like half mass. He goes, are we done? The King's depressed. I got a Roger Starbuck jersey, and I have a Dallas Cowboy helmet. And he's mad because I'm wearing Roger Starbuck's jersey instead of his. But what he doesn't understand is, they don't make a King Corcoran jersey at Sears. Only Roger Starbuck and Sonny Jurgensen. And he would just be so depressed, he just couldn't stand it. For King Corcoran, life after football would prove a greater challenge than anything he faced on the field. He started bouncing checks about 1978. At this point, it wasn't funny anymore. It's not the king no, who's the crazy quarterback play. talking on the car phone. This is the police are coming and guys are serving you papers and cars are getting repossessed and you know, what's this all about? And it just, it just steadily got worse. King's problems were not only legal, but personal. He was gone for long periods of time, so it's always been, you know, me and my mom and my brother, and he's always had his own kind of life. My Uncle George took this picture, and we're supposed to look like we miss King because he's away at football camp. And um, my mother said, all right, we'll try to act. <laughs> she was glad he was out of town. He was, up to a point, um, very charming until it kind of turned dark. <laughs> At one point in 1980, he stole her silver that her mother bought her for her wedding, and he cashed it in to buy a Lincoln for himself. And then he went in the back of her checkbook and he forged a $2,600 check to, to finish paying for the car. He wouldn't admit to it, but we, we found some of the silver in the back of the trunk. That's how she knew he did it. She used to tell us if it was just her and him, she would have split in the 70s. She just can't stand him. She just thinks he was just a bad dude. They split up when she was in her, I think it was her early 40s. Soon after separating from his wife, King stopped talking to his children. Yeah, the last time I saw my dad, uh, my brother and I had gone to visit with him. He had promised us that regardless of what happened between him and my mother, that he was gonna help us through college. And so he wrote me a check. She deposited his check in her account and then wrote South Florida a check on her account thinking the check was good. And after it bounced. They were gonna charge her with a felony because it's a $2,600 check. I called him and I called him and I called him. He just would not return her phone call. He left her hanging out there. My mom had to borrow the money, otherwise she would have been arrested. And I never did hear from him again and he never returned any of my phone calls and that was literally the last time I ever spoke to him. I was 21. The last time I talked to him was uh, May 4th, 1994, when I ran into him in the mall with my mother. We were in a mall by Washington, D.C. called Pentagon City. And we hear his walk. He's, he's got that particular walk that he does to draw attention to himself, the way he drags his feet. And, and he just showed up. We said, what, are you, what have you been up to? He told me he's doing a movie with Bruce Willis. I said, now, is Bruce Willis playing you, or you and Bruce are going to be acting together? Uh, we, we haven't decided that yet. I said, OK. His skin was ashen looking, he looked, and his eyes were bad. He didn't look good. And I said to my mother, boy, it looks like he just got out of jail. And we just found out within the last month when my mother went through his public records, he'd been released from prison on May 3rd. We ran into him May 4th. He did just get out of jail. And that was the last time we saw him. It turns out the king had quite a rap sheet. I had a librarian at the Washington Post do a criminal records check. And uh, lo and behold, we came back with a long list of court dates that he had been served for, for fraud. He ultimately ended up being convicted of tax evasion, and he went to prison. He served six months in a federal penitentiary in 1997. At NFL Films, we didn't know about King's problems until we began contacting the old Firebirds for a 30th reunion show. We found everyone but the king. And by the way, has anybody found where the king is? We knew he was alive, but we had no idea where he was or what he was doing. It was like chasing a ghost. It really was. Finally, he called us back and said, I'll come and meet you. 
He came and he met us, and of course he showed up with a young starlet-looking woman with all kinds of stories about all the things that he'd been up to. I got kicked out of Canada. I, actually, I got asked to leave Argentina. I was in Argentina for three weeks, and I was screwing around with the president of the country's girlfriend, which I didn't know at the time was his girlfriend. She was 19 years old. He was like in his 50s. I had no idea it was his girlfriend. I had to sneak out of the country, okay? It was the king. I mean, in so many ways, nothing had changed. <laughs> That's king's philosophy on women. Yeah, yeah, say that again, honey, please. You're only as young as the girl you feel. You hear that? Oh, <laughs> she girl, I love it. I got to use it. Now, how much of what was going down that night was real? I do girls, but I don't do drugs, booze, and I don't do cigarettes. You know what I'm trying Hey. How much of it was just an act? I mean, we don't know. I had certainly never heard of him being an Indian chief before. I've gone Indian, man. You know what I'm trying to say? I went Native American for a while because I lived on a reservation and I enjoyed that. I got back to my roots. He has these braids in his hair and I said, Jimmy, what are you doing? He said, I'm an Indian. I'm with the Lakota tribe. That's a Lakota Blackfoot. You're actually out of Brown in Montana. I said, you're not an Indian. And he said, Tony, if every one of us looks back far enough, we're all probably 164th Indian. I said, no, we're not. He said, they don't know. It was surprising. It was surprising. The first thing I thought of was, well, gee, if he lives on an Indian reservation, I don't think the IRS can touch him, because I think it's protected land. If you have a little bit of Indian and you, you qualify for different types of loans and, and stuff, and that might have been the angle. My, my Indian name is Running Wolf because I run with the wolves all the time. When people talk about my dad, they often will use the word that he was a schizophrenic, which is simply untrue. He was not delusional to the point where he heard things that other people don't hear. Mental illness is now Kelly's profession. I've been a licensed therapist for about 12 years now. I believe my father had a personality disorder. They're very difficult to treat. They're what's called an access to diagnosis. He was antisocial personality disorder, which means he had blatant disregard for the law. The king is only one king. And he was also narcissistic, which meant he really only existed when other people were paying attention to him. He always knew that he was putting on an act for people. He's looking like, the guy's a madman, a total madman. Well, he's not crazy, he just doesn't want to get caught. <laughs> and I played polo with Tommy Lee Jones. By the way, he's a great polo player. When Jimmy and Kelly watched our reunion documentary in 2000, it wasn't only King's mental state that surprised him, but his physical deterioration. When we saw the weight that he put on, that big stomach, we figured he was gonna have a heart attack because of that weight, because his father died of a heart attack. Uh. I got to get my, pick my pants up here. My mother said, he's not going to be around too long. I said, what do you think? And she goes, I give him five years by 2005. And he made it to 2009. On June 19th, 2009, Jim Corcoran died of a massive heart attack. When my brother called me to say that he had died, we all said the same thing. At, at almost the same time, how do we know for sure? We figure it's an elaborate hoax. We figure maybe he disappeared. He's in the Caribbean or somewhere. He could be in trouble with the law, and this is the best way for him to get them off his back. We had always considered that to be a viable option for him. Because that sounds like something he would do. That would be kind of something the king would do. You know, it's the sort of thing that he could do. Matt Schudel wrote the king's obituary. We try to verify every death by confirming it with a funeral home. There is a death certificate. I have to confess, I haven't actually seen the death certificate, so, you know, am I 100% sure? I'm, yeah, I'm sure. Do you know where he's buried? Um, I have no idea. We cremated him. The king is with us right now. Oh, that's him right That's there. Yeah, the king is with us. <laughs> Are we sure that's him? That, I, I can attest. <laughs> no, and king. I can attest that is king. Recently, we caught up with a group of King's friends. Jimmy and Kelly released their father's body to them so they could hold a memorial service. He had nothing, no estate, no anything. How can we make this happen with no money? Good afternoon, everyone. Now it's Fred King Parker. We put this tribute together in honor of him. In a donated hall, the King's friends paid their last respects. We were all lucky enough to have known the king. I spent a lot of time with the king. Rough on the edges, but when it came deep down to it, he always had a heart. Jimmy, Kelly, and their mother did not attend. To be honest with you, it feels like he died in 1987, and I just found out about it. In the end, the man who loved to live the high life died a discount death, right down to the urn holding his ashes. They said, we got one that's chipped in the back of it, and I tell you what, we'll give it to you. There's a chip right there in the corner of it. 
Originally, the story was he wants the ashes go to the Blackfoot tribe up in South Dakota and be spread across the reservation. Montana. Montana. I'm sorry, Montana. King's friends abandoned those plans when they found out about his true identity. We have no Indian blood in us at all. My father's Irish. His name's James Patrick Corcoran. His father was a truck driver and his mom was a housewife, and he grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. Because, you know, we're Jersey. King's friend, Dan Lane, keeps the urn in his home. Will you ever try to obtain his ashes? Any reason to? I really don't think that we would ever do that. No. And there's a stigma that comes with being attached to King Corcoran or being his family. It's one of the reasons we all left the Washington, D.C. area. Even in death, King remains polarizing. King is the kind of guy who would literally give the shirt off his back to you. Somebody said he'd give you the shirt off his back, and I thought to myself, he never did anything for anybody just for free. You had to provide something for him, whether it was attention, a place to live. He always took care of me, never let me down. Ask him for a tuition checker. Ask my mother when her silver got stolen what a great guy is. He didn't go out of his way and, and do anything, and if he did, it was for an audience. Go. What amazes me is the number of people who wanted to be part of King's audience, despite all of his flaws. I know he must have rubbed people the wrong way. I'm sure he did. He obviously did. But I, I like the guy. I mean, I